Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the online summer speaker series uh, of the North American Regional Science Council, or NASC. Uh, my name is Haifeng Qian from University of Iowa. Uh, I'm the chair of uh, NASC. Um, this summer speaker series uh, is a new initiative. Uh, it's a basic response to uh, the new norm that uh, now everybody is now working from home. Um, this year, uh, we're very delighted to have uh, three uh, distinguished speakers. Um, they are Professor Luke Anselin uh, from University of Chicago, Professor Kara Kochman from University of Texas at Austin, and Professor Mark Patridge from The Ohio State University. Um, of course, uh, Professor Anselin is the speaker today. Uh, he will talk about his perspectives on the field of regional science. Uh, I think it's a very good topic to kick off this series. Um, just a reminder, in two weeks on uh, July 28th, uh, Professor Kara Kochman will talk about automated uh, transportation. It's the same day, same time. It's not the same day. It's the same same time of the of the day on uh, July 28th. Uh, in another two weeks on August 11th, uh, still at 11 a.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern Time, uh, we'll have Professor Mark Patridge talk about uh, the regional economic impacts of COVID-19, uh, which of course is a um, uh, a timely uh, topic. Um, today, I'm co-hosting this event uh, with Professor Elizabeth Mack from Michigan State. Um, Elizabeth will lead the Q&A session later, so she will get a chance to say hi to everyone. Um, before uh, Professor Anselin start uh, his lecture, uh, I just want to quickly say a few words about the housekeeping rules. Uh, this lecture is being recorded. Uh, we will post a link of the uh, lecture on the NASC website, which is narsc.org. Um, Luke will give a lecture for about 75 minutes. Um, uh, we'll then have a, about 40 minutes for Q&A. Um, please post your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, you, can, you should be able to see the, uh, the, the, the link of the Q&A uh, on your Zoom screen. Um, if you prefer ask questions by voice, which is fine, um, you can use the, uh, the raise hand function of Zoom. I do want to mention that uh, we prefer you ask questions through the Q&A box, uh, and we'll answer questions from there first. Um, but if you do want to ask questions by voice, uh, please wait until, uh, I mean, towards the end of the webinar to raise your hand. Um, finally, uh, uh, I think probably everybody know a little bit or a lot about our speaker today. Uh, still, I'd like to have a brief introduction. Um, Dr. Luke Anseling is a uh, Stine Freeler Distinguished Service Professor of Sociology and the College at the University of Chicago, where he founded and directs the Center for Spatial Data Science. He previously held position, uh, positions at Arizona State University, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, the University of Texas at Dallas, the Regional, Science, the Regional Research Institute at, at West Virginia University, the University of California, St. Barbara, and the Ohio State University. He was a visiting professor at MIT and Brown. Um, he holds a PhD in regional science from Cornell University. Uh, his research deals with methods to handle the complexity of spatial data, both in spatial econometrics and in exploratory spatial data analysis. He developed the uh, software uh, SpaceStat and, uh, and Geoda. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have used Geoda at this moment, by this moment. Uh, he's a fellow of Regional Science Association International. Um, he was awarded the uh, Walter Isaac Award and the William Alonso Prize from the uh, North American Regional Science Council. Uh, and he was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2008 and the U.S. and the American Academy of uh, Arts and Science in 2011. Uh, without further ado, uh, Luke, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Haifeng, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a little strange. I like to see my audience and, and have some eye contact, so it's just going to have to be virtual. I have to imagine it. Um, this is not my usual topic, and uh, uh, when uh, Neil asked me if I would uh, give a talk this summer, um, I was really debating whether it should be a more technical talk or this kind of big picture. And as it happens, uh, some human geography colleagues of, uh, from Nanjing Normal University had asked me earlier this year to uh, talk a little bit about regional science and, and where it came from and what it is. And so uh, 
I just took that and uh, worked on it a little bit more. It's, it's a personal view, as it says in the subtitle. Uh, I'm one of these handful of people who actually were so foolish to pursue a PhD in regional science and uh, not in another regular, more recognized discipline. And so I have a particular take on this, uh, also having been at many different institutions in many different departments, it, it just gives a, a little um, perspective on this. Uh, for many of the old timers, this will be old hat. Uh, they will know this stuff, um, you know, having seen many commentaries and discussions about regional science, what it is, where it's going, but maybe for some of the younger cohorts, this is uh, something new. So anyway, um, the way I've organized my presentation, and this doesn't seem to be working, yeah, is um, I'll have three broad historical periods. The original period, what I call the classic era, which is really dominated by the presence of Walter Isert, and then after a while, people started to think, well, what is this regional science? Where is it going? Is it really doing what we wanted it to do? And I call that reflections. And then Walter passed away in 2010. So we are now in a post already 10 years in a post Izard era. Uh, and then I, I finished with some uh, comments. So how did I come to regional science? Uh, this is the personal part. So. In the mid 70s, I was um, a research assistant at the University of Brussels, Free University of Brussels, and I was working on integrated uh, demographic economic models. I had done my undergraduate thesis on zero growth, both looking at it from a sustainability point of view, but also from a demographic point of view, what happens if the population ages, how can it move to a stationary state and things like that. And in the process, uh, at the time, the time series weren't very long. So a lot of the uh, econometric and statistical studies use cross sections. And that's how I discovered um, spatial econometrics. And primarily in the work of some Dutch economists that was published in a regional science and urban economics and other regional science outlets. And so then, um, as I was thinking of pursuing a, a doctoral uh, study, um, I wasn't really sure where to go. I, you know, uh, the thought occurred to me to go to the Netherlands, but then um, uh, my uncle, who's listed at the bottom, Marcel Anselin, he was a, a planning professor at the University of Ghent. He handed me these flyers, and you know, old timers will remember the famous flyers that Walter had designed for the programs and at Penn and Cornell, they were actually virtually identical except for the faculty and the courses. And so that piqued my interest and uh, uh, my uncle had met Walter uh, during the Euro early European regional science uh, conferences and my mentor at the University of Brussels, who was an econometrician, Herbert Glacier, also knew Isart and both of them uh, very strongly pushed me to uh, pursue this, and so I ended up at Cornell. Before I went to Cornell, uh, I, my early exposure to regional science were these two books. One was this uh, really kind of interesting uh, attempt at combining ecological and economic analysis, and, and just keep in mind, this was in 1972. This was very early on when the environment was beginning to be taken into account in economic analysis. And then uh, also the uh, introduction to regional science had just come out when I was uh, looking into this. Uh, so then I get to Cornell, I was there for three years and uh, first meeting with Walter was quite interesting. And uh, first thing he does is he hands me, he says, you have to read location and space economy. Um, and we'll meet every week and discuss a chapter. So I, I came from the Belgian university system where you basically don't do that. Maybe you do it now, but at the time, you know, you went to lectures and studied the material that was presented in lectures and that was pretty much it. Uh, 
So this was very um, in your face with Walter asking me questions every week. It was quite an experience and, and really uh, something I will never forget. So the beginning was the classics, if you wish, um, location and space economy and methods of regional analysis. Location and space economy is, um, for those of you who've never met or been exposed to Walter, it's classic Walter. Uh, a general theory relating to industrial location, market areas, land use, trade, and urban structure, everything, in other words. And if you look at the contents, it's very interesting. You know, it's, it, it could have been written nowadays, except uh, first, uh, the mathematical sophistication was not quite the same as currently used in economics. And also, one, even though a lot of these chapters are about equilibrium, such as the locational equilibrium of the firm, transport orientation or labor orientation, um, there's always a lot that has to be held fixed in, even in that equilibrium. So uh, Walter was moving towards a more general theory where everything was kind of related to everything else, but uh, the tools weren't there to quite model that in a satisfactory way. Then the other book is another classic and uh, actually referred to as an introduction to regional science. And this is really, uh, in my opinion, the original image of what regional science was. It was a collection of methods, methods that dealt with the kinds of techniques that you need to do urban and regional analysis, population projections, migration, income estimation, a lot of emphasis on social accounting, uh, much more than is the case nowadays, um, flow analysis between regions, uh, multipliers, regional cycles, um, location, obviously, how to deal with uh, industrial location, but from a very interesting perspective using industrial complex analysis, which nowadays we would call clusters, but it really was that idea. Interregional and regional input output, very prominent in everything Walter did at the time. Linear programming, which was you know, basically optimization, but using the techniques of the time. And then spatial interaction models. And then very typically at the end of dealing with each of these separate methods, I would put these channels of synthesis together. And for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, it's quite something, you know, it's, it's a connection of all kinds of different uh, modeling perspectives. Some are long run equilibrium, some are short run, some are cross sectional, some are pool cross sections and time series. And all these things have somehow to fit together. Now, um, this will be a theme in, in Walter's work and also in some of my early work uh, for many, many years, trying to connect these um, seemingly unconnectable modeling frameworks into an overall scheme, an overall general model of integration. So um, just to, this is how I got to regional science in my first exposure. Uh, where did regional science come from? And um, this is really very well uh, described in this uh, book by Walter, um, History of Regional Science and the Regional Science Association International, which is really um, fascinating read on the development of something which was essentially an initiative of a few people into something that became quite institutionalized. So. Um, the origins um, really have to do with the uh, reconstruction, if you wish, although there wasn't really reconstruction of the US economy after World War II and the acceptance of planning and particularly mathematics and operations research, uh, the Rand Corporation, those kinds of institutions became very prominent in, in the US. Um, but what Isard saw was, as he puts it, no interest in location, region, or urban in mainstream economics. And he basically dismissed geography as being too descriptive. So then his conclusion was, there is an urgent need for urban and regional analysis, and no social science is 
uh, willing to nurture it, so we have to do it in something new. That new thing was regional science. Um, initially, the focus was very much on techniques, on methods. Uh, these were the um, new tools of the trade to do urban and regional analysis. The input-output analysis was very prominent. Spatial interaction modeling, the gravity model, uh, optimization in the form of linear programming, um, and a general systems approach. Nowadays, this would be called complex systems, but in those days, it was called systems approach. So it's very much a, a technique-oriented um, driven field at the time. The name is actually quite amusing because um, it doesn't make any sense. You know, a, a lot of people would argue if you have to call something a science, then it isn't. Um, and that criticism has been levied against a number of different fields. But in the early discussions, and you see this in this work of Walter and also some other uh, papers uh, by David Boyce on the early history of the field is there was uh, a lot of attention to the term spatial science and spatial analysis, which is actually quite interesting given the turn of the fields that has happened more recently where this now comes out of geography and GIS. But Walter apparently didn't want to have any confusion with space exploration and the Sputnik and all those things that were going on in the late 50s and early 60s. So uh, they settled for the term regional science, which at the time was actually within the group that got things into motion was apparently quite controversial. But um, in some of his early writings, Izard insists that the delineation of aerial unit of analysis, the regions, are a necessary condition for analysis. And this is actually an interesting point, given that uh, where we have moved into, we, we don't actually need to do that anymore. We can do a lot of analysis at the micro level, which was not part of the original motivations uh, for the field. And the field basically took off. Uh, you know, it's uh, fascinating reading, fascinating summer reading, I should say, to look at these uh, uh, early attempts of meetings and trying to get funding and being rejected and then trying again. Uh, Walter was a very persistent person. And a lot of the meetings were, uh, as a subgroup, um, in parallel with the American Economic Association, but they also attracted planners and geographers. And in 1954, um, which is more than 65 years ago, and I'll get back to that later, the Regional Science Association was established, annual meetings were held, and Walter set out on a major initiative to establish branches all over the world, in the UK, in Europe, in Asia, uh, in Japan, uh, and so on. And with that institutionalization came the first journal. The papers and proceedings weren't really a journal. They were just a collection of the papers that were presented at the annual conference. And again, if uh, as a summary, it's very interesting to look at some of these very early issues. In 1958, uh, the Regional Science Department was established at the University of Pennsylvania. Many of you know, know that by the mid-1990s, it was gone, but uh, that's a separate story that I'll get into a little later. Also, a graduate field was established at Cornell, which is where I got my PhD. It was in, Cornell has this interesting setup where not everything is a department, but some graduate topics are just graduate fields with groups of faculty drawn from different departments. And that graduate field still exists at Cornell. Um, journals came about, the Journal of Regional Science, uh, Annals of Regional Science, International Region Science Review. And I think very importantly in terms of a, a, I don't want to call it disciplinary, we'll get to that later, but in terms of the importance and the credibility of the field, was that Walter was able to convince the then director of the geography program at regional science, at the National Science Foundation to rename the program Geography and Regional Science. And that remained until very recently where the program was uh, renamed first to spatial analysis and geography and now human environment and geography. 
regional science is gone. So uh, that is a, a major loss. So the field went on pretty much focused on a lot of methods and location theory. And then in 1970, Torsten Hagerstrand, the geographer, uh, was uh, a president of the um, Regional Science Association, and he gave an address um, at the European meetings, apparently, uh, according to this writing, that was the first time that the presidential address was done in Europe. But it's very interesting. He says, when looking over the proceedings of the 60s, one gets the impression that the participants in this part of the world, being Europe, have prefer preferred to remain closer to issues of application rather than to issues of pure theory. We in Europe seem to have been looking at regional science primarily as one of the possible instruments which, which to guide policy and planning. And then he suggests we have to look at uh, individual human beings. In other words, um, personal behavior. And does this fall within the scope of regional science? And he says, yes, because it's a social science. So. He then goes on in this classic paper to outline the principles behind space-time geography, activity spaces, the so-called space-time prism. It's very interesting that these ideas have received traction in fields like sociology, but if you look at the regional science literature, um, there isn't that much. There's some, but not, not the kind of attention that it has received. Uh, elsewhere, arguably. And then Walter, in 1979, um, discusses and outlines the past and the future for regional science. So the past is pretty interesting because it, again, details the different intricate negotiations between different fields and different agencies to get things going. But interesting, his view of the future of the field. So this is 1979. This is 40 years ago. Um, what he saw, and uh, you have to realize that at the time he was working with the uh, Panas Liosatos, a physicist, on these very complex space-time, continuous space-time dynamics models, and Einstein curved space-time. Uh, that, in his view, was the future. Um, Obviously, integrated modeling frameworks were still a, an ongoing theme. And then also the extension to peace signs, which was the actual interaction among people and prob conflict resolution. And then interesting, uh, his view of the problems in the future was the absolute decline of primary metropolitan regions throughout the world. Now, 40 years later, exactly the opposite has happened. And we also needed to develop an economics of decline, which is an interesting point, but never received quite the attention that I thought Walter wanted. And I, I want to close this first uh, section with um, something that <laughs> I revisited recently. This is some of my early work on integrated modeling with Walter and uh, it's a monster. And if you look at it carefully, it basically combines different types of models, different types of data, uh, different dynamics, different spatial scales, and all this stuff has to connect to each other, feed into each other, and um, somehow be used for policy analysis. The, the driver of it is the lower uh, left box, which, which is really the programming box that um, uh, comes up with an quote unquote optimal allocation of resources, which are then fed through the other modules to give measures of impact and feedback into the optimization. So this was at one point part of a very ambitious uh, NSF proposal, but it never was funded. And I don't believe anything even close to this integration was ever implemented. I mean, different subparts obviously could be turned and were turned into operational models, but the whole thing um, didn't really go that far. And I'll get back to that in a few minutes. So here we are, you know, in the late 80s, and in um, basically in 1988, there was a 
the Second World Congress was held in Israel. And a part of that conference was a series of talks about uh, the future and the past of regional science. The regional science by that time was about 35 years old. And then in early 90s, regional science turned 40. And my the late Andy Isserman, my friend and colleague, wrote this piece on lost in space. Basically, is uh, regional science, where is it going? And then at 50, it's still going strong. There's a 50th anniversary issue of the papers and uh, a collection of different pieces um, reflecting on the accomplishments of regional science and the potential future. But also, interestingly, I discovered this paper in the Journal of Economic Geography by Trevor Barnes on the rise and decline of regional science, which appeared around the same time in a very interesting perspective. So um, 1988 World Congress, um, this, um, vo this volume appeared a couple of years later, um, by edited by David Boyce, Peter Nakamp, and Danny Schaefer, um, Regional Science Retrospect and Prospect. And very interesting. Um, so in the preface, um, it stated, the evolution of regional science toward a discipline in itself was thus based on a merger of concepts from economics, you know, general equilibrium, input output, and so on, geography, central place, mathematics, econometrics, and related disciplines. So very much after 35 years, regional science, at least in the perspective presented in this volume, is a discipline. And that discipline was so encompassing that it started to split off in this perspective. So in recent years, there's a devolution of regional science towards various subdisciplines urban economics, infrastructure economics, evaluation analysis, environmental analysis, spatial econometrics. Now, arguably, these subdisciplines might not quite see it that way, but you know, this was at least the perspective presented. And then the core themes in this book, what is regional science about? Location theory, methods, methods of spatial analysis, and policy, regional development, and regional policy. So, I had forgotten about this, but at the time I actually wrote a piece on um, perspectives on research directions for quantitative methods in regional science. And it's kind of scary to think that this was more than 30 years ago. And I particularly focus on uh, operational urban and regional models and also methods for spatial data analysis. So, um, what I thought then was the state of the art in regional urban and regional modeling. I saw five main overarching themes where there was an evolution in the early uh, work in regional science, a focus on regional accounts, which were very strictly pure economic sectors to social accounting matrices, which were um, used to look at effects on income distribution and so on. Very, uh, in some cases, people had incredible data to uh, carry this out. And similarly, the regional input output framework was relaxed and, and moved into computable general equilibrium models where um, there's a whole uh, tra trajectory and tradition of these kind of CGE models. Uh, it, Regional econometric models became more and more complex, um, uh, involved structural equations. Um, single region models became more and more multi-region as more data became available and the spatial interaction modeling became uh, more and more sophisticated. And then in my own area, the from a purely descriptive spatial autocorrelation indices, we moved to more um, Nowadays, we would call it machine learning, but the geographical analysis machine is, is very much something uh, with that philosophy behind it. And, and there were other developments, uh, similar developments. So um, 
what did I see at the time as the future? It's kind of embarrassing, but uh, closer integration of theory and models. Have we seen that? Um, yes and no. I mean, some would argue that the models are still devoid from theory. I mean, we have the uh, critique of spatial econometrics that appeared in the Journal of Regional Science a few years ago, um, mostly pointless spatial econometrics, basically arguing these are models without theory. And we could also argue that there's a lot of theory that is not very realistic and cannot be embedded into models. A second area that I saw uh, was um, to get a more realistic perspective on data, particularly one incorporated into the modeling. Obviously, from my perspective, the importance of spatial dependence and spatial heterogeneity, um, which has gotten a lot of attention, but also um, a notion of endogenous regions. So a lot of the um, regional analysis was being done with administrative regions, but, uh, and for uh, very good practical reasons, there were, the data were only available at that scale. But once you start having data at the micro scale, then the whole definition of the region itself and how a region comes about and is established as an entity, you know, um, is, is a whole other question. And I think that received a lot of attention in the work on, on clusters and cluster connections. And then a pet peeve of mine, which is still very valid today, is the truth in packaging, is that um, model outcomes are often presented without a very good sense of the uncertainty that's involved in them. And there's actually, you know, from a quite cynical point of view, there's a good reason for that, in that if you would actually quantify the uncertainty in the model outcomes, it's often so large that uh, one starts to question what the model outcomes actually mean. And so this is uh, something that has received quite a bit of attention you know, in econometrics and actually also in GIS, the error propagation in, in databases and things like that, uh, which is actually something to think about when, when you, how to translate the results of models and how to interpret what is actually being said by these models. So now we turn 40 and at 40, here's Andy Isserman and those of you who uh, knew him uh, will see this paper as classic Andy Isserman. I spent many, many hours and several long walks uh, with him talking about this when I was at the Regional Research Institute. And so he has this paper that actually was uh, published twice. Um, there was an earlier version in the Review of Regional Studies and then a, a, a revised version appeared in the International Regional Science Review. And he examines the roots and dreams of early regional science, focusing on its scholarly association, its concepts of region and science and its chain claim to be a separate discipline. And then he's very critical. Regional science never became a science or a discipline, and it has a peculiar relationship to regions. You know, going back to my earlier comment about the need to define regions. But yet, it has had spectacular successes. And so, in the paper, he basically couches it as at 40, is regional science having a mid midlife crisis? Is it lost in space? And he makes a number of points. Uh, regional science failed, failed to become a discipline or recognized as such by the outside world. Um, there was a lot of criticism at the time in the 90s that regional science was dated doing old models, old questions. Um, in geography, for example, there was somewhat of a backlash against quantitative methods. Um, there were ongoing debates about what the intellectual core uh, of regional science should be. Should it be all encompassing or just focus on some particular uh, sub areas? And um, very um, acute at the time was the loss of the department at, at Penn. And uh, that wouldn't have been so bad 
in and of itself, were it not that there was nothing else to replace it. So there were no new degree granting institutions that would institutionalize um, regional science. So basically, I encountered this problem firsthand with a PhD in regional science, who's going to hire you? You know, this is a while ago, but still every, you know, geography department would say, no way, you're not a geographer. Uh, economics departments would say, no way, you're not an economist. So the only uh, outlets were regional science departments of which there was only one, or uh, at that time, planning departments were pretty um, inclusive of different perspectives. So um, that's where most of the early PhDs in regional science ended up, uh, actually. So um, Andy also pointed out, and we could disagree with this, um, the first one in particular, I think is, is uh, debatable. He argues that there was a lack of relevance in U US economic development um, policy of regional science. Regional science, in his view, was not a player uh, in contrast to regional science in Europe. But uh, I think, uh, arguably, regional scientists were players in, in this uh, game, but maybe not recognized under the uh, aegis of regional science. And then and he also claimed that regional science largely ignored environmental analysis, which again, the same comment can be made to that, maybe as regional science that was correct, but there's plenty of environmental economics that was done by people who were involved in regional science. So, and he has a, a pretty strong critique. It's not a science, it's not a discipline. And I, this quote is actually, I find very interesting and something we can think about and talk about. So, and it's from Lloyd Rodwin in 1959, so way at the early uh, stages of regional science. The regional science issue reduces itself to the argument that the social scientists don't emphasize space as much as they should, and geographers aren't sufficiently analytical, hence regional science. That was Izard's original argument. But suppose the social sciences do develop more systematic spatial studies and geography does become more analytical. Isn't regional science likely then to become just a generic name for interdisciplinary regional studies? And you know, this is something to think about because in some sense, this is actually what happened. Uh, space has become more prominent in the mainstream social sciences not just economics, but also sociology and political science. And geography, arguably, with a GIS and the spatial analytical revolution has become more analytical. And then by the end of the 90s came the new economic geography, the book by Fujita, who also has a PhD in regional science, and Krugman and Venables, who don't, on the spatial economy. And uh, a lot of regional scientists reacted very negatively uh, to this book, uh, Andy Isserman being one of them. He has a, an article criticizing this, um, basically seeing it, uh, it as same old, same old. But actually what this did, and many people recognize this, and there's a, uh, I'll, I'll point this out in a few minutes, there's an interesting interview with Krugman and Venables and Fujita about their particular perspective. It was um, a, a very technical piece where new tools were used to address these problems that Iser and von Thunen uh, were tackling. For example, in von Thunen, um, there is a central town and then you model the land use around that town. But the question in the new economic geography is where did that central town come from? How did it come to be? That's not part of the model. So with uh, new economic and mathematical tools, the Dixit Stiglitz modeling framework, the notion of icebergs where transportation costs just, just kind of disappeared as, as you move uh, things along, uh, making a lot of things endogenous. Um, and the criticism at the time was a lot of mathematical elegance, which 
arguably made it credible to the economics profession, but sacrificing empirical realism, you know, two regions, one type of labor, two types of capital, things of those kinds of assumptions that uh, empirical people just shrug their shoulders at and say, well, how can that ever have any relevance to anything? But it was argued by some that the new economic geography would be the rebirth of regional science. And it's kind of interesting. We turn 50 and we have this special issue of the papers in regional science, uh, the brightest of dawns, you know, 50, 50 years of regional science, uh, which is a celebration of regional science. Uh, many papers looking at uh, different topics um, and uh, by a, a collection of uh, names, well-known names in, in the field. And basically it's an optimistic view, the brightest of dawns, you know, it's very uplifting. And the historical assessment is very optimistic, very positive. Uh, David Boyce has a brief history of the origins, which is very interesting. Um, Andy Isserman, did a uh, uh, citation impact study of who were the people in different phases of the 50 years that um, were most prominent in the literature and in citations, Brigitte Waldorf and some others did a review of the greatest books in regional science. So everything is great. Um, well, these are the, the two papers. The, the topics were, um, interestingly, um, now embraced a new economic geography that has become part and parcel of regional science. And then the other topics are pretty much uh, the traditional ones, you know, agglomeration, networks, uh, location, cities and regions, transport costs, uh, growth development, but also some new things, uh, you know, GIS and spatial data analysis. How did that end up in regional science all of a sudden? And, you know, uh, other things are traditional. The environment is back in um, migration modeling. So um, there is some fluidity there where uh, regional science is in fact, or at least this view of regional science is encompassing things from all kinds of other areas into a large encompassing interdisciplinary field if there is such a thing, yeah, very interesting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, around the same time, Trevor Barnes uh, wrote this piece in the Journal of Economic Geography, which basically was about um, what is the future of the new economic geography? So this is an attempt at not merging, but bringing together economic geographers as geographers and geographical economists as economists into something new. Of course, from a regional science perspective, you would say, well, that's what regional science originally was supposed to be. But then uh, with this new twist from the new economic geography, um, how, how does that work? And Barnes takes a particular perspective. He uses a framework by the philosopher uh, Latour, who uh, wrote a book on the science of sciences. So basically what is a real science and how does it come about and how does it survive? And more interestingly, you know, how do new sciences emerge? You know, things like computer science, for example, that didn't exist. You know, but even statistics was part of mathematics and somehow was able to split off and survive. And computer science in many ways was part of engineering or mathematics and also managed to split off and survive as a new science, if you wish. Uh, but others did not. And so uh, what is it that makes such a new field, a new interdisciplinary field, successful. One could think of uh, sustainability science, which uh, was a big deal uh, when I was at Arizona State University with the first school of sustainability and many new sustainability programs are being established. The question is, is this, um, can this survive? Can this exist 
separately and in some sense in competition with traditional disciplines. And I think the jury is still out. And regional science went through, through something very similar. So um, what does this framework consist of? It consists of these five loops, uh, basically um, instruments, which are papers, publications, um, autonomization, as it's called, is, is the existence of colleagues and like-minded people. Alliances are alliances with not necessarily like-minded people, and then the context, uh, the public reality, the real-life policy and real-life politics, and how that uh, comes into play. And so he has these five loops. He calls them instruments, colleagues, allies, public presentation, integration. Critical, according to Latour, is the existing of the integration, that these four pieces should not exist in isolation, but should be tightly integrated and um, reinforcing, self-reinforcing. And that creates a science that can survive a, separate from the classic sciences. So he then goes on, Trevor Barnes, uh, to describe uh, the rise and, in his words, the fall of regional science. And the rise is you can find a lot of this information also in the history that Walter describes and David Boyce. The instruments are the early books, the classics, location space economy, methods of regional science, different book series um, that are being established in regional science. Pion had the British regional science series. Uh, uh, Elsevier had one and Springer. Uh, journals, um, methods being implemented. These, these are all success stories uh, in the regional science case. The autonomization is the inst institutionalization. And Barnes has an interesting uh, description of how early on uh, Walter Isert and the regional science department at Penn had many um, quantitative geographers who then basically turn their backs on regional science. And um, if you haven't read this piece, David Harvey was one of them. And nobody would think of David Harvey as a regional scientist these days. But uh, Michael Deere was another one. Uh, I believe Michael Deere might actually have a PhD in regional science. So these are the kinds of things that um, in the early days, regional science was able to connect to these other, um, create its own set of um, colleagues, but also connect to others. And there's an interesting story in the article about how Isart sent Alan Scott, who had been at the Regional Science Department at Penn, to England to convince the British to start their own um, Regional Science Association. And this became actually kind of uh, tense because uh, as we all know in Britain, there is both a regional studies association and a regional science association. Uh, and the role of Pion as a, an, a publisher early on in promoting regional science is very critical. And then um, as Barnes argues, uh, the climate right after uh, the second world war with the military industrial complex and a lot of planning, a lot of mathematical social science, operations research, management science, um, big urban renewal, um, transportation infrastructure, the interstate system, um, it all fit quite nicely to uh, support regional science as a, a field that provided the methods and the analytical tools to analyze these issues. And then he sees uh, the decline, and here we could probably argue with a lot of the things that he says. Basically, he sees the, the instruments as the models are too complex. Now, if you recall the integrated multi-regional model, you might say, well, yeah, it is too complex. But they became, in his view, marginalized. We could argue with that. Then, obviously, there were problems um, with the um, field, as such, especially after the closure of the department at Penn. Now, uh, 
geography went through a similar crisis in the um, 80s and, and earlier where uh, very prominent departments like Harvard, um, Michigan, Northwestern, and the University of Chicago were closed. But that was not the demise of geography because there were many others. And in some sense, uh, the loss at Harvard and Chicago was the gain of other departments who then became more prominent in their own turn. And uh, geography is far from dead. But with the closure at Penn, other than the program at Cornell, the, and somewhat of a program, but no, not really a degree granting program at Illinois, and something at the University of Arizona, there wasn't really another, you know, beacon there to take over the role of the program at Penn. Then in Barnes' view, uh, the geographers and the planners um, departed. And actually, he might have a bit of a point there that critical geographers definitely walked away and were dismissive of the more, if you wish, traditional quantitative perspective in regional science but also the advent of um, collegiate planning, I think, um, created a bit, a bit of a loss in that in the early days, the regional North American Regional Science Conferences were way bigger than the ACSP, the Collegiate Schools of Planning Conferences. And then there was some parity, and I think in recent years, ACSP is actually larger than NARSC. So, for the planners, then it becomes a matter of allegiance. Am I with planning or am I with regional science? And I'll get back to that later. And from Barnes' perspective, uh, which we could argue with, is that regional science was marginalized uh, in a post this, post this, post that society. And maybe here, there's a difference between uh, the European perspective and the US perspective. So anyway, then he goes on to argue, uh, what does this mean for the new economic geography? Will it take over the intellectual terrain of regional science? But as we've seen, the way regional science thinks of itself, or at least many people in regional science think of itself, it's much more encompassing than the new economic geography. The new economic geography is very specific, a very mathematical framework, a particular way of modeling the world, whereas regional science, you know, I mean, one could argue does everything, which is quite different from uh, the uh, new economic geography. His critique, Barnes' critique of new economic geography is that the models are too complex, unrealistic, little empirics. Uh, that has changed since 2004, but it's still a valid uh, point. There is no Department of New Economic Geography. There is no New Economic Geography Association. There's not even a New Economic Geography Journal. The journal is called Economic Geography. So uh, one could argue that some of this important institutionalization hasn't happened. And he also goes on to suggest that economic geography is basically uh, the prey of economists. Economists are just taken it over. And his conclusion is that um, the intermediate ground, so the merger, which is really what the Journal of Economic Geography is all about, the, the merge or the interaction between economic geographers as geographers and geographical economists as economists, uh, he doesn't see that happening. He does see separate futures for each. So back to the original disciplines. Okay, in 2010, uh, Walter passes away. Uh, so we move into an area where his formidable presence, even until the very end, you know, there wasn't a conference or Walter was there. Um, and so what, what does that do to the field uh, without him there? Um, so as it happens in... Um, 2014, Manfred Fischer and Peter Nekamp put out this enormous volume, um, Handbook of Regional Science. And the introduction is regional science at full gallop. And uh, interestingly, but it isn't mentioned anywhere, 
This is regional science at 60. So we're getting a little older here. And the handbook is meant, um, it brings together major contributions to regional science, um, advanced collective knowledge in the field. And it's um, basically incredibly encompassing. And again, it's this idea of regional science encompassing many, many things. And in their introduction, um, they state regional science is a broad multidisciplinary orientation on regional and urban issues, combining and being complement to regional economics, social and economic geography, urban economics, transportation science, environmental science, political science, planning theory. So rather than being something that um, is new as a discipline and borrows from these different fields. It is a different way, in you, if you wish, of looking at urban and regional issues that is not purely disciplinary, but multidisciplinary. And again, the emphasis is still on regional science as a powerful uh, scientific methodological toolbox used in many analyses. And the core principle behind everything that, I guess, from my perspective, makes it worthy of being considered regional science is this importance of location and agglomeration. Friction of distance, economies of scale, proximity, connectivity, um, inherent in the spatial behavior of economic agents. So location and agglomeration theory are the integrating theme but the handbook has no less than 83 different contributions. And it covers a whole range of different things, things that are traditional um, regional science, regional housing, labor markets, economic growth, innovation, new economic geography, location and interaction, but also some things that weren't really necessarily identified with regional science, such as spatial analysis, geocomputation, spatial statistics, and spatial econometrics. So it's a very, and I should mention a second edition is in the works. So it's a very encompassing view of, of what constitutes regional science. And then uh, again, Peter Nakamp, Adam Rose, and Karima Kurtit uh, put out this edited volume, uh, which is uh, a memorial volume to Walter Isard. And um, again, the themes, they're the same themes, but they change a little bit. So location is still there. Spatial interaction is still there. Complex systems is back under, you now it's called complex space economy, but channels of synthesis, basically the same thing. A new or renewed interest, I should say, into generic laws. And, and uh, interestingly, there is also a movement to develop something called urban science, which comes, uh, is kind of, uh, if you wish, a rediscovery of social physics. Uh, but it's, it's a, a primarily coming from physicists uh, looking for general laws, scaling laws in um, different urban phenomena. So this is something that is not necessarily originated in regional science, but is, is moving into it and spatial disparity. So an interesting piece, I thought, uh, and in one of the chapters in that volume is an outline of the architecture of spatial economics. And I find it interesting that it uh, mentions spatial economics and doesn't mention regional science. But it basically is about regional science. If it uh, distinguishes between um, three parts, three pillars, if you will, uh, conceptualization, which basically theoretical background, disciplinary framework, which I find very interesting um, because some of these might be argued are not really disciplines, and then operational methodology, which um, 
I think has always been the strength of regional science, the spatial modeling, spatial econometrics, input output, prediction, evaluation methods, dynamic model. So this is kind of, if you think of it, um, could be viewed as what regional science of the future might be, although I find it very interesting, as I mentioned, that it's referred to as spatial economics and not as regional science. So anyway, this is where we are. Um, what is regional science? And here's some the last few minutes. I want to give some uh, personal takes on this. Um, first of all, I think I agree with Andy Isserman and I know several others that regional science is not a discipline, has not managed to become a discipline, and I would argue shouldn't be a discipline, but it's rather an interdisciplinary forum. And I think this is situated with thinking about how um, science and social science progresses and the tension that we see between established disciplines and new research questions that emerge. Uh, I mentioned sustainability. That's a classic example uh, that doesn't fit in any particular discipline. It doesn't fit in political science and sociology and economics, but economists, political scientists, and sociologists engage with sustainability research questions. So the question then is, should that separate itself out or should it stay contained within the disciplines? And uh, from a personal perspective, this is actually uh, very close to home at the University of Chicago, there's a very strong disciplinary tradition. And um, they have their Chicago school of this and that and the other sociology, economics and so on. And so they're very um, strong, you can always almost call them beliefs about what a discipline should be. And this new stuff doesn't fit. And so how do we deal with that? You know, you can't have a degree in something that is not a discipline. So um, in contrast to where I was previously at Arizona State, where the president said, forget about disciplines, uh, we're interested in research questions. So we're going to set up these new schools with very complicated names like human evolution and social change. And they just address certain types of research questions, and I don't care what discipline it is. We have economists, geographers, anthropologists, sociologists, everybody is there. So the question is, uh, from a principal point of view, this is very healthy. From a practical point of view, not so much, because then you get trapped in the same situation as I was in with my freshly minted PhD in regional science, where can I get a job? Who thinks that I'm a credible um, social scientist? I don't fit in any box. And so I think this is a tension where regional science can continue to play a very important role as an interdisciplinary form, forum, uh, bringing people together from different perspectives. And a second point, which uh, is not mentioned very often in, in these various discussions about the past and the future of regional science is that what I've observed is that regional science, at least the meetings and the journals, have uh, served as an incubator for new ideas and new subfields. Uh, ideas that are not necessarily um, welcome in the traditional disciplines at first, but uh, gain credibility, gain momentum by uh, special sessions at the regional science meetings and um, journal issues and, and so on. And along the same lines, um, regional science and the journals and the books have served at, as an outlet for topics and methods that were not yet accepted by mainstream disciplines. And let me give a, a concrete example where um, I talk about spatial econometrics, obviously a uh, very personal uh, experience. Uh, I have uh, a paper on that where, you know, from the margins to the mainstream, which gives more specific detail, but 
it's very interesting in the beginning, spatial econometrics and my first exposure to it was not in econometrics journals or statistics journals. It was in regional science and urban economics. And if you look back to the early work in the you know, late 70s and early 80s, it was regional science that provided the home for spatial econometrics, both uh, publish, allowing publication in regional science journals, special issues in book series. Uh, at that time, there was very little to uh, almost nothing in mainstream econometrics. And also the regional science conferences uh, provided a forum to bring people in that were not necessarily, uh, wouldn't call themselves regional scientists, uh, people like uh, Harry Collegian and Ingmar Prucha, who were theoretical econometricians, but were interested in spatial questions and found the regional science conferences uh, as a format, as a way to engage with others. And over the time, as I argue in that article and, and uh, we, we see it confirmed, the uh, spatial econometrics became mainstream, so to speak. And so there's now a spatial econometrics association. There are separate conferences. There is a journal of spatial, spatial econometrics, but also, and if from some perspective, from a disciplinary sp perspective, maybe more importantly, uh, is it acceptance and incorporation in mainstream econometrics. So there are special issues of the Journal of Econometrics. There are books by traditional economics publishers. So uh, it's incorporated in the classic econometric textbooks. So that's a story of incubation through regional signs. Um, you know, as an aside, so my dissertation was on spatial econometrics with Walter as my advisor. And you might say, well, what does Walter know about spatial econometrics? Well, nothing, actually. He was very critical of it. He, he, he called it a red herring. And so it was my job to convince him that it was not. And luckily, I had Bill Green on my committee as well, who helped a little bit in that regard. So, um, I can see other examples of this, not just in spatial econometrics, maybe in network analysis, um, maybe not so much in sustainability, but um, urban economics, although it did exist, it was not really looked upon very highly in the mainstream economics field, but it grew and expanded under the aegis of regional science to the point that it now has its own separate conferences um, Location analysis is still very much part of the regional science community, but it really um, flowered under that umbrella. So I see that as a very important uh, uh, aspect of the regional science community. So tongue in cheek, regional science at 65, does that mean retirement? For most people in Europe, it does mean retirement. In the US, we can work a little longer if we want to. So I would argue no, right, obviously. Um, I'm not retired. The interest in region, space, place, and location is not going to go away. In fact, if anything, it's becoming more central. Now, is this good for regional science or is it bad for regional science? You know, it's back to the Lloyd Rodwin argument, you know, if um, spatial econometrics is becoming central or part and parcel of mainstream econometrics, is there still a role for it in regional science? Or if uh, activity spaces become prominent in sociological work, is there still a role for it in regional science? And, and I would argue, yes. The second reason is uh, that regional science, whichever way you define it, remains organized uh, around a very strong methodological toolbox that has applications in many, many different fields and uh, applications to many 
uh, policy questions. A lot of policy questions today deal with the fact that there is a lot of heterogeneity spatially. You know, one size does not fit all. Uh, we see it today in various lockdown measures um, applied in different places. Uh, one needs the methodology to address the importance of location, place, and space. And finally, as a third aspect for the future of regional science, is something that I have always appreciated, you know, first as a very young scholar, but over the time it has not changed. I have always experienced regional science and its conferences and even its journals as welcoming, supportive, and non-threatening. And unlike um, some disciplinary cultures in other fields, uh, regional science has always been very tolerant for uh, views and ideas that were not necessarily fitting in a particular disciplinary box. And I think uh, as long as it su supports and sustains that aspect, I think it uh, has a potentially very long future ahead of it. So that's it. Thank you very much, Luke. So we are now going to move to the question and answer portion of the webinar. And people are sending in questions via the Q&A, which is what we would like you to do. And so as questions come in, I'll read the um, name of the person that asked the question and also then just the, their question verbatim. So the first question is from Eric Heikela. And he says, wonderful presentation, Luke. Interesting point about regional science as an outlet for new methods and approaches. That is a kind of incubator role, but in a conceptual slash academic space rather than economic space. What might the scholarship about incubators have to offer here by way of guidance? That's an interesting point. Um, I mean, I think it, it's probably worthy of a, a closer study to look at um, how particular people or particular groups within regional science have served as incubators for um, new ideas and new subfields. I think that, um, I'm not going to do this, but I think it is something that's uh, interesting to pursue, to see to what extent the, the ideas that what we've learned from incubators in you know, the role of economic development or um, you know, technological change can be, uh, whether parallels can be found within the organization of regional science. And you know, once we understand better how exactly this works, maybe that could provide guidance into new formats or new venues or new ways of um, bringing people together and, and stimulating this. It's an interesting point. Okay. Question number two for, comes from Hal King Wang. And they say, regional science does not have an organized job market for PhDs, postdocs, and junior scholars. If it does, would this help to institutionalize it into a discipline at some point, at least close? Thank you. A good point. I mean, this is exactly what is seen by many, Andy Isserman being one of them, as one of the failures. I mean, if regional science had the ambition to become a separate discipline, which I know it did, in the, especially in Isart's view and in the view of many of the original um, founders of the field, um, then it needs an, an institutionalized job market. And so that's also my point about some of these other new fields like uh, new PhDs in sustainability science. You know, who's going to hire them? I mean, that's not that easy to do. We, we work in an institutional environment that is still in many, probably most universities ruled by disciplines organized in departments. And if you don't fit within that framework, um, it's very difficult to, to get a job, an academic job. So where do people end up? They end up in think tanks, which is not bad, or they end up in other interdisciplinary departments 
But then, you know, that's a chicken and egg problem. You know, if those departments don't exist, there is no way to place people. And so one, I think one of the um, missed opportunities, if you wish, of regional science is that for a long time, there were just two departments. And actually, Cornell was never a department. It was a graduate field. But there was not a new regional science department, say, at the University of Illinois or at the uh, University of Arizona. Or at the time, there was talk, Andy Isserman re, uh, mentioned this to me, of establishing something like that at the University of Southern California. So just imagine if all of a sudden there is a department, instead of just one department and one graduate field, there are three, four, five departments. And then there is a certain momentum and that, that can sustain it. But in the absence of that, I think anyone, and this is a, a debate we had and a discussion we had uh, at ASU, uh, any one of these new interdisciplinary PhD programs intellectually are very rich. And for a graduate student, they are fantastic because they don't box you in into a particular view of a particular training set. Like, uh, for example, to be a proper economist, you have to do A, B, C, and D. To be a proper sociologist, similar things. In these new programs, it's very much research question driven. So there is not this checklist of do this and this and this, and then you're okay. Then you can call yourself whatever it is. So for a graduate student, and this is also why I was attracted to it, this is very interesting, very stimulating. Um, once you graduate, you say, oh, now what? You know, uh, and in, in my particular situation, I came from Belgium. And initially, I always thought I would go back to Belgium, but then I didn't realize there were no jobs in Belgium either. So, you know, th that is a problem. And I think for any of these newer fields, in order to become established, and sustain themselves in the in the sense of Latour and the discussion that Trevor Barnes has in his paper is very difficult. And it is a question of initial momentum, funding, um, you know, riding the right tide of society in some sense. I mean, how did computer science become its own legitimate um, discipline with its own separate departments? That is not questioned anymore. Now, 40 years ago, or when I was an, an undergraduate, uh, and there were no computer science departments. There were people doing computer science and electrical engineering and in mathematics, but as a department, it didn't exist. So that's, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem. Okay, so the next two questions um, deal with uh, potential areas for study. Um, so Calvin Jang at, says, a really thorough presentation, given that regional science has changed so much, what would you advise to current undergrads and newcomers who want to explore this subject? This question is especially motivated by the fact that we are taking classes and gaining skills in some newer fields like JS and computer science that may not have fully existed 40 years ago. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is actually my students, so. <laughs> The, um, that's a good question. I, for an undergraduate, I think there's a distinction between undergraduate education and graduate education. I think in, as an undergraduate, at least my perspective on that is that you can never go wrong getting exposure to as many different perspectives as possible. Now that runs into the danger that you know a little bit about everything and nothing much about anything in particular, but I think at the undergraduate level, it's very important not to get boxed in too early and to get a broad perspective on, on different things. As a graduate student, that's different, that changes. Then you, you, you move into specific research questions and then you want to um, get the skill set in order to be able to address these research questions. So the skill set includes exposure to theory, knowing what different fields have done about that research question, uh, 
and exposure to methods, knowing what you, how to analyze and how to measure, how to interpret and so on. So I think there's, there's a difference there. As, as an undergraduate, I don't think you can go wrong with getting solid exposure to computer science, statistics, spatial thinking, economics, you know, and, and so on, um, not get boxed in too early. But as a graduate student, it's a little bit different. Okay. So an anonymous um, question asks, do you have a suggestion as a planning PhD to integrate with the field of regional science? I feel that now planning and regional science are a little disconnected, even though they have a lot in common. How should urban planning, the field of urban planning, embrace what regional science can offer? Yeah, that's, that's interesting because what has happened, and uh, actually in part I experienced this during my career, was it, so I started my career at a, urban plan, at a planning department at Ohio State University. And at that time, there were very few actual PhDs in planning in the department. Nowadays, if you look at most planning departments, they are dominated by people with PhDs in planning. So planning has been able to make this transition from being applied, a policy field, to becoming an academic discipline with its own departments, its own PhD programs, its own conferences. And in the early days, uh, there were no ACSP conferences. So the planners with scholarly interest would come to the regional science conferences. And there was a lot of interaction between the two. I think nowadays there's still a lot of interaction between the two, but because there's only so much time in a day, you know, there's many, many more conferences. There's also many more planning conferences compared to what used to be the case. So I think maybe there's a little less interaction than there was in the past, but I would argue, uh, I don't see a split between these two. There are many people that go to both regional science conferences and planning conferences. And there's, I, I think, still a lot of cross fertilization of ideas between the fields. But Planning is an interesting example of where something that wasn't really um, a strong scholarly discipline, you know, most planning programs had master's degrees to train professional planners. Very few had actual PhDs. Uh, but nowadays, most planning programs have a PhD as well. So that, that has kind of changed the focus of the field and I think, but I don't see necessarily a, a schism between the two. I, I still see a lot of connection and overlap. If you see who publishes in the journals, a lot of people publish in G regional science journals and in planning journals. Uh, you know, I, I don't think, I don't see that, um, you know, split, but my perspective is maybe a little bit different from somebody who's just starting out. And so, yeah, I think um, it's an interesting uh, question and it can be quite daunting, I think, for a new PhD, seeing all these different fields and, and where, where figuring out where you fit in. But uh, this is, I think, one of the strengths of regional science. It's very welcoming. It, it doesn't really care where you come from and which is very different say if you try to get a paper accepted at an economics conference you better be a legitimate economist and so that is that is one of the distinguishing characteristics that i see the regional science field as having so a question from yu ting hao how do you consider the relationship between regional science and the newly emerged urban science which seems to rest on big data and new ways to analyze such data yeah, so I did, you know, uh, refer to the new urban science a little bit. Um, a lot of regional scientists would argue that this is um, old stuff reimagined. And so a lot of the ideas uh, that come out in urban science on the scaling, Zipp's law, these are concepts that have been around for a long time. What the urban science 
has done or is able to do is because of the new data availability is put maybe some more um, empirical credence behind these different laws and assess to what extent and in, in what parts of the world they actually hold. Um, it's an interesting debate because there is there are a couple of programs now that uh, call themselves urban science. Um, whether that will evolve into something similar or better than regional science uh, remains to be seen. You know, there's as as we discussed, there are all these different elements that have to fall into place. Um, I think one of the elements that is pushing this right now is big data and smart cities and the, the, the ability to actually model things at such a fine grained scale that we were never able to do before. You know, one of my favorite comments is that um, we talk about big data, but the example that Cliff and Ord use in their spatial autocorrelation book is 26 Irish counties. N of 26, you know, and that was in 1979. That was not in the 18th century. That was pretty, I mean, from my perspective, pretty recent, you know. So this is a, this is a major uh, change. And I personally don't see why regional science cannot adopt this perspective and why this particular urban science perspective necessarily has to be separate and couldn't be encompassed under the umbrella of regional science. But that's, you know, in fact, I'm pretty sure that um, several of the regional science conferences have important urban science components to them and sessions devoted to that, to big data, smart cities. In fact, I think it's the theme of this November's meeting. You know, so. I, again, I don't see this necessarily as a split. I think urban science, a lot of the social physics has been around for a while, um, but the machinery wasn't there to actually operationalize it. And that, that I think is a major um, and important difference with the past. You know, uh, I mean, if you remember the work on that Isar did and Leo Sadas on a continuous space-time economy, you know, in 1978 or 79, there was just no way you could even try to empirically verify it. But now you can, you know, you have micro data, you have phone data, having people's movements in real time, you know, you could not even dream of that at that time. So this put a whole different light on, I think, some of the older ideas where we can now actually see to what extent this can be empirically verified and, and modeled in different ways. So, so, you know, if one is a real believer in regional science, then one would say, well, urban science is part of regional science. You know? And I, again, I don't see it necessarily as a as a as a split. A question from Pablo Mejia Reyes, and it, they ask: It seems to me that regional business cycle analysis has been largely absent in regional science. What do you think the reasons might be? Uh, that's an interesting point. I I wouldn't have thought that, but maybe. This is again an instance of where specialized journals are focusing on this. Uh, journals that look at business economics and you know small business economics. Uh, I, you know, I don't. I, I think maybe in the last um, because there was actually a very sustained in the U.S. at least a very sustained period of economic growth there wasn't much of a cycling going on. And so then as a result, there aren't really acute, interesting questions because if you don't have a business cycle, why study a business cycle? So I would think that maybe some of it has to do with that, but now 
but what we're going through, I think this is going to come back. And in fact, there is already a big discussion about um, what kind of recovery will happen. Will it be a quick recovery, a slow recovery, no recovery? You know, these are very much regional business cycle questions because regions, and I'm sure we'll hear about this in the third talk, regions are not affected equally by this crisis. And some will be able to rebound, maybe even come out ahead, and others will not. And I think that that will create a renewed interest in regional business cycles, I think. I suspect that the lack of interest in the past 12 years is because there haven't been any cycles to speak of. Okay. A question from uh, Michael von Meteren. And he says, I, or she says, I really enjoyed your presentation and really like to see the history brought up, to, brought up. My question regards your own roots in getting into regional science. You mentioned your uncle acquainting you into the field through the Ghent connection. I suppose that refers to the third international conference in Ghent, which must have been around 1963. Have you ever heard stories about, about these conferences, either through your uncle or through Isard himself? Could you tell a little bit about the atmosphere around those early international conferences? How were they received? How did they come about? How busy and influential were they? Yeah, I don't know much other than reading the history in, in Isard's book uh, of how they came about, but it was very much, um, and actually I heard a lot about uh, these meetings from my uncle at dinner, you know, my uncle had a summer place um, in Provence. And as a college student, I would spend a week there. And so he would talk about these um, meetings in various places. Uh, in, uh, you know, he was, would talk about how um, this cohort of Americans would descend, you know, Tom Reiner, Walter Isart, there were a few others uh, that, and they would connect with a local person or local persons. And then the meetings were very much um, open-ended. I, uh, he would always talk about how um, stimulating they were because they would, I mean, Isaac was a, you know, it was almost like a preacher, you know, he was going to convince you that regional science was the next great discipline. and. You know, so there's lots of stories about Iser being persistent at these meetings, even when he didn't understand a word of what people were saying. You know, there's this one story of Iser was a piano player, and there's this one story of him mediating a meeting between Japanese regional scientists. And the story goes that under the table, Iser just played one piece of music after another with his fingers because he couldn't understand a word of what these people were saying, but he was still there. And so there's lots of these kind of interesting tidbits. He was quite a personality. And uh, as I got to know him myself, he was quite a character and it took a character like that to actually push a discipline forward. He had tremendous amount of energy, was very persuasive and would find the right people in different countries to, to get this going. And there were always important social aspects, you know, um, dinners and things like that associated with these meetings. And there still are. Okay. A question about political science. Um, it comes from Natapong Sang Arun, and they ask, may you explain the political science perspective within regional science? Well, the, the, there is not too much uh, political science in regional science. In the beginning, if you look at the early history, there were a few political scientists, but um, the regional part in political science is um, mostly related to international relations and to uh, a little less to electoral studies, but the inter international relations part became very much a part of peace science that Isard um, pushed uh, in his later days. So um, the peace science, it still exists. There's still a journal of peace science. It's, it's kind of a, an, again, an interdisciplinary area, uh, mostly political scientists, but also geographers and 
legal scholars looking at uh, international conflicts and how to resolve them, but also local conflicts. So I think the political science aspect of regional science um, has moved into this peace studies and peace science arena. The, um, uh, there is spatial analysis in political science, but it's not as prominent, say, as in sociology or uh, economics. So the next series of questions are dedicated to sort of a perspective look at regional science. So one question comes from Jay Wan Lim. And they, they ask, do you think this can be a new niche market or a potential for regional science? If so, does regional science need to focus more on applicability rather than developing theories and or methodologies? And they're referring to interdisciplinary programs. Yeah, I, I think both. I think the, the, the strength of an interdisciplinary perspective that I see is that you have to be both disciplinary and interdisciplinary. So you have to be very strong in the component disciplines, so to speak, which means that you have to read more than your own field. And, and that is very challenging because um, it, it's more than just being good in one field. It's, 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 uh, it's being exposed and exposing yourself to the perspectives of other fields. I mean, it's nothing, uh, it's actually very refreshing to um, go, for example, as I've been able to do during my career and present uh, at the time, primarily spatial analysis type of perspectives to scholarly meetings of anthropologists, for example, which I have, you know, I mean, I had very little exposure to, but then to learn to speak a language that both of you can understand because each of these disciplines tend to speak their own language. And one of the, I think, strengths of regional science is that it never forced anyone to speak a particular language. Whereas, you know, if you have ever submitted to economics journals or sociology journals, there's a very special, or medical journals for that matter, there's a very special way in which you formulate your article. Even the structure in, in medical journals follows a particular format. And so in regional science, that's never been the case. And everybody from whatever perspective they came from, geography, economics, planning, it didn't really matter as long as it made sense. And, and so I think that is a strength of the field and something that it, uh, it should continue to emphasize is this kind of welcoming uh, culture and um, tolerance for different ways in which um, ideas are presented. For example, if you look at regional science journals, you find both highly mathematical exposures with lemmas and proofs and all that stuff, as well as verbal descripture, descriptions with you know primarily descriptive support of the argument. And, there's room for both. In many disciplines, that's no longer the case. And they have uh, basically, uh, I think, uh, become rigid in a particular format. And this is also one of the critiques of many disciplines, you know, uh, critiques of economics, for example, especially US economics, that is very predictable. It's always the same mathematical framework, the same proofs, whereas, economists in other countries, like in France, for example, don't necessarily follow that framework, but that doesn't mean that their insights are any less um, interesting or meaningful. You know, I look at the work of Piketty, for example, that is very non-American analysis, but it's very insightful. And so regional science, I think, never fell into that trap and it never said, well, this is regional science and this is not. Uh, you know, I have yet to, maybe others have different experiences, but my experience with editors of regional science journals is that that is never an argument. Whereas if you submit something, say, to a sociology journal, they will readily say this is not sociology. Right. And so I think that um, 
makes it interdisciplinary, that makes it a, you know, fertile ground for incubating new ideas and exposing people to different perspectives, which I think is a strength that uh, traditional disciplines um, may be losing in some sense. A question from Esteban Lopez. They ask, what advice do you have for early career regional scientists? What are good places slash departments to be at? And how to better show the importance of spatial analysis in other departments that may still undervalue the insights that regional science has to offer? Uh, that's a scary one. <laughs> the, the, I think right now for any academic field, the prospects are actually quite scary for young scholars in in the traditional academic um, outlets you know many universities are cutting down on tenure track positions there's a proliferation of temporary appointments lectures various names for them but it's basically a reluctance of the university to invest in a long-term academic career but i think the good news is that not everything has to be a university and there's many new think tanks and startups that need people with the kind of interdisciplinary perspective that regional science offers and so i think um, if i were to start over i would probably not necessarily consider an academic career but um, in some respects these alternative paths even though they may not give you the usual, you know, uh, status, the, the academic status, whatever that may be worth, but they do allow you to think about really critical problems, often in much more real time than in academia. You know, it's, it's sometimes uh, frightening to see how long papers are uh, in circulation be before they actually get officially published. So these are basically old ideas. And if you deal with real-time policy, you have to have the answer next week and not five years from now. So that I think is very exciting. And if I were to start over, I would be very attracted to that environment rather than maybe a tr traditional academic environment. I think right now, the prospects for traditional academic environments are not good, no matter what field. You know, universities are, and they not separate from the COVID crisis, which is going to you know uh, bring an additional set of turmoil. But I think universities have been moving along a path of um, increasing, um, in the U.S. at least, a lack of funding. So what used to be public education is, is increasingly privatized, even in the public part. So tuition is more and more expensive. I mean, even unaffordable, you know, and, and these are all factors that then uh, turn back into how, how is a university organized? How many departments can it support? How many full professors can it pay for? And, you know, old timers hang around for a long time. So that closes up uh, options for new people. So I don't, unless there's major policy changes in the next few years, I, I, th I think the traditional academic prospects are, are not very good. But even then, I would think um, whether as a regional scientist, you are accepted in other departments depends very much from department to department. Uh, for example, in my own case, uh, at, when I started out, no geography department would even consider hiring me because I was not a geographer. But then UC Santa Barbara did, and I was not a geographer. But they didn't care because they had physicists on the, in the department and people with other backgrounds, so planners. So some departments have evolved along those lines. Other departments are still closed door unless you are a certified economist, geographer, sociologist, they will not hire you. So uh, at one point I thought that this would change. Now I don't see it 
that optimistic anymore necessarily. You know, what I experienced at the University of Chicago is very disciplinary, very reluctant even to reinvigorate something like uh, geography, which has a long tradition at Chicago, but basically no longer exists. So that's, there's a lot of reluctance. Uh, it's a zero sum game. You know, if you give new resources to geography, you have to take them away from somebody else. And who's going to give up their resources for a new program? You know, it's, and increasingly I see that happen. But the good news is I think there's lots of exciting stuff going out there in startups and uh, lots of foundations, new foundations. You know, one of the, I guess, um, positive side effects of the increasing unequal income distribution in the US that there's a lot of billionaires with money to spend on foundation and, and think tanks to uh, analyze issues that they're concerned about. So that's a whole new avenue for um, regional scientists that I think should not be downplayed or ignored. A related question from an anonymous person asks, what are the most worthwhile directions in regional science that we students can study? That's a tough one, and you know, I, I, I won't. Uh, it's, it, that's a very difficult one because uh, obviously I have my own biases, and uh, my own biases are that because of the advent of the new data and the big data that somebody alluded to earlier, there are ways to study uh, phenomena that were not possible before, and I think a regional science should embrace that maybe even more so than it does right now. There, there's, there are new data and not all of them are big, but there are new data and new measurements that allow us to look at our old questions with a new lens. And I think those are the most promising areas. That's not to say that the old areas couldn't be revisited in their own right. I mean, I'm, there's lots of people still doing work on theoretical location theory, and that has its own value. But I think from my perspective, the most uh, productive and uh, the most, the areas with the most potential to really find new insights are the ones where we take advantage of these new measurements and these new data to either investigate new questions or revisit the old questions with the new tools. I, I personally, I see that as the something where regional science can remain uh, relevant. Okay. Um, we're coming up on the final three questions. Jason Brown asks, without a discipline to connect to, what are the steps we can take to attract new members to this forum? From your perspective, what has worked well in the past? What should we do differently? New members to the regional science, I presume. Well, I, I think, as I mentioned, uh, one of the strengths of the regional science community is its welcoming culture. You know, nobody ever gets turned away for uh, being a particular background. You know, engineers, even legal scholars, um, you know, the, the, I think the a classic example was the first World Regional Science Conference, which was held at Cambridge. And it was just about anything you could think of. There was even, uh, I was the designated note taker for Walter and I had to go to sessions on urban design, which I knew nothing about, but there it was in the World Regional Science Conference, a couple of sessions on urban design. So regional science, I think has this open arms, uh, as long as there's interest in region, space, place, location, interaction, and even in spaces other than geographical spaces. You know, if you're interested in network interaction, you know, that um, regional science is, has a home for you. Now, whether that means you should pursue a PhD in regional science, that's a totally different question. You know, I think that is, uh, you know, unless you really know what you want, you know, that you should go in eyes wide open, knowing that uh, 
uh, it probably does close some doors for you, unfortunately. Well, this, these questions relate to the upcoming talk. So we have a couple people with questions about COVID. They say, um, how do you think the post-COVID era will affect, or how do you think COVID will affect the field of regional science and other fields that study urban and regional issues? And a related question says, um, yeah, how do you see, what, how, what is going to be the impact of COVID for regional science? Well, let's rephrase this question. And what was the impact of the flu pandemic on social sciences in the early 20th century? Hmm. None. You know, as long as things return back to normal, we will have forgotten about COVID a few years from now. Now, the big question is, will things return back to normal? And a lot of that, I think, we don't know is uncertain because we don't really fully understand what COVID is, what, uh, how it transforms, will we be resistant once there is a vaccine, you know? So once there is a vaccine and treatment, the impact of COVID disappears because I don't think it is because we have to social distance to prevent the spread of COVID that all of a sudden we have to redesign our spaces and our regions so that we don't interact with anybody anymore. I mean, that is the logical conclusion of changing your life according to COVID is you, you know, would you do what we've been doing the last three months? You sit at home in your office and don't talk to anybody except through Zoom. So maybe there will be uh, an impact in certain sectors, you know, at least short term, um, an, an impact on Retail, for example, maybe an impact on manufacturing with a higher degree of use of robots instead of people who actually have to interact. Mm -hmm. You know, those are structural changes that may have been in the works, but just get a little jolted by the COVID impact. But I would hope that um, not just COVID, but that we develop an, an infrastructure that can cope with the next pandemic and doesn't necessarily imply a shutdown of society as we've seen in many parts of the world. So um, I think COVID is real, of course. Um, it will have an impact uh, as we'll hear in a couple of weeks on regions. It will affect different regions differently, but I don't think we can live our lives as humans where social distancing and lack of interaction becomes the norm. That just doesn't work. And so we have to figure out a way to deal with this either through new medication or through uh, early detection, early warning systems, because it's not just COVID. There are other things out there that are bound to spread around. And because we have such a global society, you cannot hold these things back. You know, you cannot... Uh, assume that just because it starts in one country that it will stay there. That is just not mm -hmm. the case. So uh, I know there's a lot of discussion in urban planning, for example, about density and COVID. Well, you know, COVID mean we go back to the suburbs, we start living away from each other. We don't live in high rise apartments anymore where we have to share an elevator. So these are real questions during a crisis. I personally don't think these are necessarily structural changes. And the real issue is how do we deal as a society with a pandemic or the threat of a pandemic, you know, basically making sure it doesn't be become a pandemic before, you know, uh, so, and that is possible. I mean, it has been shown in the past with Ebola and other examples that it is possible with early detection and early intervention, uh, with the tools that we have at our disposal right now um, to deal with this in, in, dare I say, a much better way than we've dealt with it um, in these past few months. But I don't see it, I mean, I hope it does not mean that all of a sudden we have to structure our lives being paranoid about the next pandemic. Yeah, okay. 
Well, before I um, hand it back over to Hai Feng, there were three people that wrote in with some words of thanks, and I just I will close the Q&A session with those. So Eleonora Davalos wrote, Professor Anselin, I just wanted to let you know that your research has inspired me since I was an undergraduate student. Excellent talk. Thank you. Krista Court writes, I very much like the description of regional science as an interdisciplinary form and perhaps not a discipline. I believe that places like West Virginia University's Regional Research Institute and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign's Real Lab and the la your lab's Luke have succeeded because they functioned as incubators of new ideas with faculty, staff, affiliates, and students from a variety of disciplines. And finally, Elham Erfanium writes, Thank you for the great presentation and thanks to the NARS team who have worked hard to provide us with this opportunity. So thank you very much for your time, Luke. I will hand it back over to Haifeng. Yeah, well, thanks to the team. I would say excellent support, not a glitch, fabulous. Thank you, Liz. Um, uh, I think we are running out of time. Uh, so just last note, just on behalf of NASC, and I'd like to thank Luke for your excellent talk today and uh, also thank everybody for participating. And I think we had uh, really some really good questions today. Uh, just a last reminder, uh, our, next, our coming talk will be on July 28th, uh, same time, uh, 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern time. Uh, will be by Professor Kara Kalkman from University of Texas on Automated Transplantation. I hope to see you all again then. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.